welcome to the Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns. I'm Rosemary Truman, the founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation. And I'm very, very pleased today to have Jim Greenwood, the president of the Bio Association, um, the world's largest life sciences membership organization with me today. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for coming on to the podcast. Well, I'm delighted to be with you. So Jim, you have a fabulous background and I would love it if you could just give us a, a few bullet points on your background and how did you get to bio? Shall I start with my birth? Yeah, <laughs> start with that. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I'm, I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I have a, nothing but a little undergraduate degree in, anth in sociology from Dickinson College. I was, uh, I made a, um, I'm one of these uh, 60 baby bo 60s baby boomers who made a commitment to himself to uh, do something of service for my life. Started out doing things like uh, being a house parent with uh, disabled children, uh, a social worker with um, abused and neglected children. Uh, I was a campaign manager for a guy who ran for Congress in 1976 and we lost by a whisker. Then I was, uh, uh, I was elected to the State House of Representatives when I was about 28 in the state senate six years later and then congress uh in 1992 and served there for 12 years on the uh, energy and commerce committee where i did a lot of health work and uh then uh, in uh, 2005 i left congress as i like to say undefeated and unindicted <laughs> and uh, i've been running uh, the biotechnology innovation organization for the last uh, almost 16 years now it's a long time it well is. So as you know, at the Center for Advancing Innovation, we, we work with um, universities, 55 universities, 27 federal labs, and the rest are hospitals. Um, and we work with about 170,000 inventions, which equates to about 500,000 patents. And then we systematically create startups around these inventions that could have a, a significant impact on human health. So over the last few years, we've launched 200 life sciences companies. And, um, you know, I'd love to get your opinion about what you believe the most important improvements should be in the techno technology transfer ecosystem. Well, you may know more about that than I do, but I'll, I'll give you the thoughts that I have. I think actually um, uh, the, there have been, a, been steady improvements. I think you go back to 1980 um, when the Bayh-Dole Act was created, um, it, was a, it was really a, a, a milestone in the history of biotechnology because uh, what those two United States senators uh, decided was that if we were going to um, lead in, in life sciences and other technologies, it would be best to incentivize uh, uh, academic researchers and uh, colleges and universities with which they are associated to not just do basic research and write papers and uh, go on to the next paper, but to actually figure out how to get um, intellectual property um, that could be based upon what they've, what they've learned, uh, and then license that uh, intellectual property out to uh, those who would uh, try to commercialize it, try to turn that basic uh, information into, into uh, practical um, applied science that could then wind up in, in our case, making medicines. And I think um, for a long time um, in many uh, universities, um, uh, I think academics thought that things that were monetary and commercial were sort of beneath them, that it was, uh, they lived, uh, and I don't mean to say this in a pejorative way, but they lived in sort of an ivory tower where um, the currency is all about knowledge and not about uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so I, I think there has been over time, and I think to some extent it's, it, there still is a range of capabilities uh, uh, with, with, uh, among the universities as to who does a better job than others. But I think over time what the universities essentially said to the, the academics is, look, there's, um, there's money to be made for the university here. There's money to be made for, uh, for the uh, investigators if they want to. Uh, go out into business, and some of them um, do sort of do both things. They stay in academia and also academia and also create these uh, these spinouts uh, companies. And so, I think it's been a, a good, uh, a great process, uh, leading to much of the advancement that we've made in the life sciences. Um, but uh, I, again, I think there are there are universities that do 
tech transfer splendidly and are wildly successful at it. And then there's the other end of the spectrum and everything in between. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you know, you also run bio runs this amazing, um, amazing events generally, but the, the big event in, for example, in June of next year, the big international conference, and you get to see a lot of the dynamics that occur when, when companies are launched and they are looking for seed funding. You know, your, your platform with bio has, is incredibly helpful for these new companies for them to access capital. What do you think needs to be improved from that perspective? In terms well, what of- we do, just to, so everyone understands what we do, we do a number of things. Um, we have, uh, we put conferences and conventions on of, all over the world, um, uh, most notably in the U.S. in uh, uh, coming right up next, uh, this month, actually beginning on October the 21st, is the Bio Investor Forum in San Francisco. And that's aimed at the privately held company, companies. So we, ha- we invite um, hundreds of small companies to come and hundreds of investors, mostly uh, venture capitalists, and they do a, there's a whole series of presentations uh, that are made. And of course, the, the VCs um, listen to all of the data that's presented and have one-on-one meetings with the company's leadership uh, and decide uh, whether they want to invest. Uh, in February, we do the same thing in New York City for uh, mostly publicly traded companies. We have institutional investors there mm. um, and do the same thing. Then at the international convention, which, as you uh, noted, will be in June in San Diego, um, we have our huge business forum. Uh, and unbelievably so, uh, we will schedule something like 47, 48,000 one-on-one meetings wow. uh, in the course of just a couple of days. So if you're those who are interested in uh, doing business-to-business um, uh, discussions about licensing, in-licensing, out-licensing, mergers, acquisitions, investment, and so forth, um, can avail themselves of, the, of this opportunity. Uh, and if you're, if you're going to attend, you, uh, in the weeks, in the run-up to that convention, you uh, can search uh, all of those who will be participating in the business forum. You can search them by name, by company, by disease, I think by molecule for that matter, wow. uh, and then uh, uh, ping them, see if they'd like to have a meeting. If they respond affirmatively, then we schedule that meeting. And when you get to the convention, there are huge uh, uh, room in the convention hall with literally something like 500 and some uh, 10 by 10 booths. And uh, you look at your schedule and it tells you where to go uh, for the speed dating hour by hour. So um, I I think we have a pretty good system. I think it's a question of just making sure that people understand that it's there Mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, know how to use it. And of course, our staff is there uh, before the event, during the event to help everybody maximize their the benefit that they can get from that process. Well, we're really excited because we're going to have some of our startups uh, pitching at your October event. So Good. thank you very Good. much about that. Yep, we're just uh, finalizing the list. Um, so, you know, you've done, a, I guess, another thing that Bio does is a lot of policy work. Yes. And so what do you think the keys to the creation and execution of good policies are? Well, it's a big question. It's a critical question because um, right now, uh, the good news is that the science is galloping. I mean, you can always say that the science is better today than it was yesterday because that's a fact. Science builds upon itself. But I do think in the in the biotech world, we're really at an inflection point where if you look at what's going on now in, in gene therapy and in cell therapy and in immunotherapy and CRISPR-Cas9 and all of that, uh, we're really um, at, a, uh, at the dawn of a, a, a new age uh, of medicine. Uh, that is going to bring more hope to more patients than ever before. And I don't think it's overly hyperbolic for me to say that I don't think there's a disease um, that we can't eventually uh, treat and ultimately cure. Uh, There's no scientific reason why we can't do that. Um, We have great scientists, we have great uh, entrepreneurs, and we have investors who are willing to take these crazy risks, knowing that uh, nine out of 10 times the projects fail. The mm-hmm. only thing that will that will stop this is bad policy. And mm. unfortunately, the bad news is that there's just an overload of bad policy around. Mm. Now, why is that? Um, uh, the, the reason for that is fundamentally that many people uh, cannot affordably access the products that we make. And um, why is that? 
if you watch the news or read newspapers, uh, you will constantly hear the phrase skyrocketing drug prices. Um, that's actually not happening. Um, there are um, the, the increase in prices, uh, average prices of prescription drugs over the last 12 months has been minus 7%. So uh, drug prices are not skyrocketing. Um, well, of course, we have some very expensive new uh, once and done therapies that can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but on the, on the main drug prices are not rapidly increasing. What has changed dramatically recently is the number of people who have high deductible health insurance policies. Mm. So, you know, the phenomena is that the insurer comes to the employer and says, your premiums are going to go up by X percent. The employer says, I cannot afford that. Uh, what can we do? And often the insurer says, well, you can continue to raise the deductible. So now half of the people in the country who receive mm -hmm. their health care from their employers are in high deductible plans. Mm -hmm. And when do they encounter those deductibles? It's usually at, at the pharmacy. Most of us, fortunately, don't have uh, surgery in a given year. So people go to the drugstore and they um, are asked for hundreds of dollars out from their wallet. And 30% of the time they leave the, the, the drugs on the counter because they don't have the money. Oh. So that's... That's what we're facing. And unfortunately, that out-of-pocket cost is inflated with price. Mm -hmm. So the story always is Mrs. Jones can't afford her insulin because it's too expensive. Well, actually, Mrs. Jones can't afford her insulin because she has a very large deductible. deductible. Now, um, obviously, prices and, uh, prices and out-of-pocket costs are not unrelated, but they're not the same thing at all. I always use the example, if you have a thousand, uh, uh, if you have a, a $10,000 cancer drug and you have a $3,000 deductible, you have a $3,000 problem. Mm -hmm. um, if you applied the most draconian price controls to that drug and cut the price in half to 5,000, the patient with a $3,000 deductible still has a $3,000 problem. Right. So we can't simply price our way out of the patient's dilemma. So uh, long answer to your question, but what we're trying to do now is um, is change the facts on the ground for the patient. And that's all about uh, out-of-pocket costs. And we're starting with the Medicare Part D prescription drug program. Mm -hmm. 45 million people benefit from that program. When I was in Congress, I was very active in creating that program. The problem with it is uh, the way it was designed is there's a $415 deductible now. Then you go into the initial uh, coverage phase. You have a 25% liability for the patient and the donut hole in 25%, then you go into the catastrophic and you have 5% liability there. So of those 45 million beneficiaries, a million of them are paying more than $3,000 a year out of pocket, and many are paying 5,000, 9,000, 12,000 and up. So what we've proposed is that the Congress put a cap on out-of-pocket liabilities of about $200 a month. That would be an, of enormous benefit oh, for yeah. all, of those, all of those beneficiaries. And what we've said is, um, we'll pay for it. You know, the drug companies will figure out how to how to structure the benefit so that we help pay for that for that cost. So the taxpayers don't have to bear it, nor does the beneficiary. So that's what we're trying to get through in Congress. Um, uh, so that's a long answer to tell you what we're up to. But to answer your direct question is, how do we best do it? I think instead of just constantly saying no, we, we're against this and no, we're against that. This time we've come forward with a solid proposal that will be of great benefit uh, to a whole lot of patients and a willingness to step up and help contribute to the costs of it. Well, I think that what you're proposing is fantastic. I just recently have had um, my own uh, insurance. You know, I have a only $1,500 deductible, but still, I, of course, used all that up and then had a different plan for my teeth and I had to have a implant and that's very expensive uh even if you have a ppo so um it's amazing how how much these things cost out of well you know the, the thing of it is is when we were creating that the, the part d program back in 2003 i think it was mm -hmm. um uh 2008 excuse me um the the uh the fiscal conservatives wanted the patient to have quote unquote skin in the game uh, and it was very awkward on at the time to say you know, patients will spend as much money on uh, health care as someone else will pay for. And there's some truth to that. Um, and so that makes sense if I twist my ankle mm -hmm. and I'm going to decide, do I want to call an ambulance to take me to the emergency room 
mm-hmm. at the cost of thousands of dollars? Or do I want to call my neighbor and ask him to take me to an urgent care center mm-hmm. where my x-ray might be $100? Uh, and so that's good economics. But when it comes to medicines, um, skin in the game makes no sense. All it does is it destroys adherence. So people don't right. take drugs. And when you destroy adherence, people get sicker. They end up in the hospital and end up costing the healthcare system more. A lot more, right. Right. So, so nobody's taking extra drugs because they're cheap or free. Right. Um, so I think at, across the board, uh, eventually in the commercial market, there should be limits on how much you can require of, of patients to pay out of their pocket um, uh, for their medicines. I, I, when I talk to members of Congress about drug pricing uh, policy, I say there are two moral imperatives. And if you follow these two moral imperatives, you can't go wrong. The first is that no one should ever do without the medicine they need because they cannot afford what's required to come from their pocket. Mm-hmm. It's that second moral imperative. And that, and that the first moral imperative applies to all the people for whom we have um, developed some kind of treatment or cure. The second moral imperative applies to an even larger group. And those are the people for which we don't have, for whom we don't have treatments yet. People with Alzheimer's and ALS and Parkinson's and diabetes and so forth. Uh, and the moral um, precept there, moral imperative there should be never advance policy that's going to drive investment away from this wonderful new science. Um, And much of the policy that's been proposed on price controls and indexing our pricing in the US against international prices and so forth would be have a devastating effect on investors Mm. who, um, why would anybody ever invest in a a biotech company that has a one out of 10 chance of getting to the marketplace if they have have no ability to control the ultimate uh, pricing of that product? Right. So what, what, is your, what are your thoughts on the value-based pricing that, for example, Novartis has put forth, these new business models of pricing drugs? Yeah. I, think, I think it's absolutely critical, particularly as we move into these gene therapies, for instance, mm-hmm. where you have a very, uh, by, by, def, by, it, by necessity, a very high price. So, for instance, uh, the, one of the poster childs is Spark Therapeutics. I think you, you know them in Philadelphia where they've uh, come up with uh, a treatment for uh, a relatively rare uh, genetic condition that causes kids to go blind. And they figured out how to insert the correct genomes into the cells of those eyes. And those kids, you know, are able to play baseball now. So, but the the expense is something like, I think I want to say $450,000 an eye, which is what you what kind of pricing you get when you have a rare disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be shocking to the payer. Um, but allowing the payer to, to work out a deal with the, with, the, with the innovator to say, we will pay for this over time mm-hmm. and we will pay for it so long as it continues to provide a benefit. Um, and I, I think that makes all the sense in the world. So um, I just wanted to go back to, um, well, let me ask you a different question. Are there any other very important policy issues that you're working on at Bio right now? Well, I sort of tangentially referenced um, the, the international pricing indexing. So mm-hmm. President Trump, um, like so many other people, has uh, observed the fact that uh, in America, we pay far more for prescription drugs than is, is paid in by citizens in Canada and Europe and, and most other places. Uh, and uh, understandably, when people have high deductibles and they're paying a lot of money out of pocket and they hear that, that these prices are so much lower elsewhere, they're angry and they want to know why that is. And President Trump has proposed that for uh, starting with Part B um, drugs, the injectable drugs, the mostly biologics, um, that we're going to take uh, 16 nations and take the average price that those nations pay for drugs, and then we're going to pay like 126% of that in the U.S. Now, the reason that prices are lower elsewhere is because they have single-payer systems. Mm -hmm. And in a single-payer system, the parliaments pass an annual budget. They don't have entitlements per se. They pass a budget. Uh, This is how much the health ministry is going to get. The health ministry says to the drug people, this is how this is your budget this year for, for prescription medicine. And so when our countries companies sit down with the negotiators to negotiate in those countries, they might say, well, we get $1,000 for this in the U.S. And the person across the table says, well, you're not in the U.S. now, you're in Germany or you're in the U.K. 
we can only afford to give you $200. Mm-hmm. So um, the, the company will take that because it's better than nothing. And at that point, they've finished their, their, their R&D and their clinical trials. So it's, they're left with their manufacturing costs. But uh, were we to import those prices, um, the margin would never be sufficient to attract the um, investment into this high risk, um, highly risky enterprise. So going down to the level of those countries is not the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, um, the, the reality is that um, uh, what we need to do is probably talk to those con- countries uh, making this more of a trade issue. Uh, say, so when we're trading, when we're creating new trade agreements with these nations, um, create some incentives and some pressures for them to more fairly uh, reimburse our products. Um, we do pay more than the rest of the world, and the rest of the world does free ride on us. They can't deny that. But it's not as if we gain no benefit from that. Uh, we have nearly 2 million jobs because 57% of all of the drugs that are innovated in the world in any given year are innovated here. And many of the drugs that are innovated in Europe and in Asia are innovated for our market. So we get the benefit of having all of those jobs mm-hmm. leading the world. We get the benefit of having all of those medicines available to our people, whereas they are uh, uh, very much restricted in other countries. Our patients get access to clinical trials sooner. Um, so it's not without benefit. What do you think the probability of that policy being passed is? Uh, we're quite worried about it. Uh, our number one uh, goal is to, uh, is to get the president to withdraw that proposal. It's an executive order. So mm. it's not something that Congress, the, uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi just came out last week with a proposal that would do a similar thing, but it would apply those prices not only to the Medicare program, as President Trump's proposal does, but to all drugs all and all commercial uses as well which would be uh, a disaster. Yeah, devastating. Right. So what we would prefer to see is we would prefer to see Congress begin by fixing the Medicare program, as I mentioned earlier, put a, pocket, a cap on out-of-pocket costs, which would be a wonderfully thing, wonderful thing to do, um, and some other things that, that we've pr- agreed on in a bipartisan way to make it easier for generic companies to compete with us um, and start there uh, and consider that a very good accomplishment um, upon which to build into uh, those kind of caps in the commercial market. And hopefully the, the president would see the wisdom of, of, if he were to sign that legislation, then to withdraw his international price indexing proposal. Mm. Well, Jim, this has been very enlightening. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to mention about the bio organization? Well, I would say this. Um, if you are a, a, a company, a biotech company anywhere in the United States, um, and you're not a member of Bio, now please join. Uh, if you're a small company, it's not all that expensive. It's $175 per FTE. You get a lot of benefit from joining. We have group purchasing programs. You get discounts to our conferences, and many times those benefits exceed the, ve- the cost of the dues. And frankly, right now, uh, in this very existential um, moment where uh, the policy is so threatening, we need every shoulder to the wheel and uh, love to have all of your any companies that are out there struggling in, uh, in this uh, environment to uh, join up. Well, we'll we're, we're going to encourage all of our startups to join, of course. Great. Um, so I have one last question, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, sure. um, so we know that you have, you were involved in Enron. Would you, would you like to illuminate <laughs> the audience on the well, Enron? Sure. <laughs> so I mentioned I was on the, uh, started on the energy and commerce committee. Um, and uh, in my latter years before I left Congress, I chaired the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. Uh, and uh, Enron occurred uh, during my tenure there. And so we uh, launched the first hearings into the Enron um, scandal. Uh, and a scandal it was. I mean, you know, uh, people may or may not know all that went on there, but it was really, um, uh, it was really an attempt to enrich a handful of upper executives um, mm-hmm. by, at, at, at the cost of not only all of the stockholders uh, in Enron, but, but they had encouraged so many of their employees to invest all of their retirement uh, dollars into Enron stock. Wow. And so we did an investigation. We subpoenaed a lot of people and um, um, brought them forward. And there's actually a, a movie called The Smartest Guys in the Room, 
uh, in which you can see uh, yours truly uh, <laughs> uh, uh, questioning uh, some of the Enron uh, top brass. Um, but we did a lot of, um, of, uh, of investigations into corporate malfeasance. It was, it was not only Enron, but there was Global Crossings and WorldCom and the whole set of, uh, it was a, a time when there was a lot of work that needed to be done uh, uh, and a- out of that came the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, hmm. which in some cases maybe went a little overboard, but it, it was designed to protect investors from a lot of these um, uh, scandalous behaviors. Well, thank you for I, sharing that. There was that. a couple of, couple of, of great mo- moments in, the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in those hearings. We had uh, Andy Fasto, who was the, the CFO for Enron, and um, when uh, I was interviewing him, I referred to him as the Betty Crocker of cooked books. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's and uh, well, who who didn't love it was General Foods, who owned the Betty Crocker label, and they <laughs> their lawyers quickly uh, dispatched a memo to us asking that we no longer uh, libel dear Betty Crocker. Aww. <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, it, it was, we had a little fun with it while we were doing it. Well, that's, that's, that's good. Um, well, I'd love to check back in with you uh, in a few months about sure. what's happening with the, the policies and, and what you think could be changed there. Yeah. And, and also- We'll know by the end of the year, this will, this, okay. either something significant will happen or it won't, but uh, it's going to get very, quite, quite dramatic, I would say, come late December. Ooh, okay. Well, we will definitely check in with you. And, you know, for the audience, um, Jim likes birds. And I don't know if there's any, uh, I usually have like three or four cardinals like running around out oh. here. I, I actually used to think that they just follow me around, but there's just a huge cardinal po- population in my, uh, this area. Yeah, well, my, my, my passion and my hobby is photographing birds and I go all over the world to do it. And, uh, Next month, I'll be in Costa Rica for a couple of weeks chasing uh, the birds through the jungles there. Excellent. Well, be careful. <laughs> I will. Be careful. And thank you so much for your time today and the, the very valuable um, perspectives you've provided. I think that we, everyone sh- should benefit from them uh, hmm. and everybody should go to bio and, and join bio. So join. thanks again, Jim. I All right. Have a good My day. Pleasure. Thank Take you care. for having me. You too.